All right, standard trade model. We can use this trade model to actually talk about trade on the basis of differences in resources. We can also explain trade and what happens in this country uh, if the trade is on the basis of differences in technology, okay? So both of these can be addressed here. So what is the standard trade model? Well, we use uh, the concepts that we've studied in Econ 101, production possibility frontier, yeah? It's curved, and the reason is because uh, there are diminishing returns to factors of production. Diminishing returns to factor of production, unlike the Descartian model, which assumed that there were there was constant returns to factor of production. Right, so we're going to use the concept of production possibility frontier, and we're going to use the concept of indifference curve. This is giving us the production side of things, supply side, yeah. And uh, the demand side is coming from the preferences. So the demand side is being reflected by the indifference curves. So you can think of the indif indifference curves as preferences of the whole society right? instead of just an individual to the whole society. And so we have indifference curves, which are this shape. That means the two goods that we are looking at considering are substitutes in general they can be to some extent substituted and as you move away from the from the origin we are on a on higher indifference curves and that generally means that the country is better off why because it's consuming more of both the goods okay. now also we know that there are not just three indifference curves there's a map there are infinite number of indifference curves here okay there's a map yeah and whenever we have a price line which is in your textbook, please note this, is referred to as the ISO value line. So when, once you have the prices, then you try to get to the highest indifference curve. And that is wherever it is tangent to the highest indifference curve. Okay? And this is also sometimes referred to as a consumption possibility frontier because this tells you what is, what is the maximum of the two goods that you can consume. Right? More on that later. This is just a, a small summary of stuff that you've done in your Econ 101, right? Now, this is important, guys. We have done this for the Ricardian model and the Hexerian model. The reason, as one of you guys um, asked me, uh, about the demand function, uh, now, for the demand function, we had, uh, we always assume there's a demand function, right? You always assume there's a demand function. Now, uh, we don't play around with this. But why? Because so far we've looked at two models, and in the two models, we've looked at differences in resources and differences in technology as, as a basis for trade. Okay? And consumption, we assumed, is the same in the two countries. right? So consumption was being rep represented by the demand function. So we just assumed that because there's no play here taking place here. There's no play here. The, play, the whole play is in the, on the production side. Right? Uh, this was a production process, uh, PPF technology. This is where all that all the action was taking place, right? And why? Well, because the differences across the countries were in re resources or technology, which affects the production side. It doesn't affect the consumption side, right? So we are going to uh, use that, and then we are going to. Uh, now express the production side and the consumption side this time. The production side would be the production possibility frontier, yeah, and the consumption side is your indifference curves, right? And that is going to be giving us the equilibrium for the home country, right? So uh, let's begin. Uh, first of all, I'm going to ask a few questions. Uh, this is our production possibility frontier, right, guys? Now, uh, let me ask, what happens when the, suppose this country which produces cloth and food, and cloth is, let's say, labor intensive, yeah, and food is land intensive. Yeah. Now, what happens when all of a sudden there are, there's an increase in labor supply? Okay. What happens to the production possibility frontier? PPF says what is the maximum of the two goods uh, that you can produce given your limited resources? So where it sits, this PPF, depends on your resource constraint, right? 
you would like it to be as far as possible. That means you're producing more of both the goods, right? <laughs> but um, you are constrained in terms of your resources. The further you move away from the origin, the PPF is producing more of both the goods. Yeah? So you want your PPF to expand, to expand. All right, so what happens when there's increase in labor supply? What happens to the production possibility frontier? Those of you who have your notebooks out and your pencils out, uh, try this out. Yeah? So increase in labor, you have more resources. That means your constraint, this constraint is now relaxed. You can produce more. So the production possibility frontier is going to shift outwards, right? Now the question is, is it a parallel shift or not? Well, no, because um, the, the good that is more labor intensive would, or from that side, you would have a bigger increase than for the other side. So you have a production possibility frontier, which expands outwards, but it is a biased expansion. It is a biased expansion. All right. Okay. Now, what about change in technology? Well, let's say agricultural revolution. Okay. Well, in that case, technology improved relatively more in the food sector, yeah, in the agriculture sector, than it did for the cloth sector. But if the technology improved only in the food sector, only, so if the question is that there's only agricultural revolution, there's no change or improvement in the technology of, of the cloth sector, only the food sector, then you will have an outward shift of your production possibility frontier, but there would be no change in the production of uh, cloth because there is no change in the technology for the cloth production. Yeah? And if there is only industrial revolution, only your um, technology has improved only in the cloth sector, in the manufacturing sector, not in the agricultural sector, it's only in the, then you would see an expansion of your production possibility frontier on the cloth side and the food side would stay the same. Yeah, all right, that's right, all right. So now uh, once you have the price line, uh, which is also referred to as the ISO value line, I'm just going to show you what happens when there is increase in land? We know how the production possibility frontier changes. Yeah. It's outward shift in possibility frontier and bias towards food, yeah, which is more land intensive. And so let's draw that line. This is your, what your production possibility frontier is. What if the relative price of cloth is still the same? Well, then you have an ISO value or a price line which you are, is going to be parallel and you're going to try and find a tangency point. So these two lines are parallel. And what you see is that the country which has more land produces more of food, no surprise there, but it produces less of cloth. This was the Jabzinski theorem, remember guys? that when you increase one factor of production land, then the good that uses intensively that resource, the output of that good increases, yeah? and the output of the good, uh, the other good decreases. This was your Lipsinski's theorem. Yeah? For the, at the given prices, at the given relative price of cloth, and we've assumed given price, given relative price of cloth by assuming that these two lines are parallel. So there's no change in the slope of this line, which is relative price of cloth. Yeah. So what does this give us? Well, this tells us that if land expands, yeah, if land increases, then that's how the output output mix is going to change. Yeah. It also tells us, we can think of it in a different way as well. It also tells us that if there are two countries, let's say home country and the foreign country, yeah, 
and the fourth country is land abundant and home country is labor abundant let's say i i should call them country one and two but that's okay then foreign country is going to be producing relatively more food compared to the home country yeah so it can be we can think of this in terms of land increasing or we can think of this as in terms of these two graphs representing two different countries and we have the output mix that are different you guys know where i'm heading with this yeah I'll just get to that, all right? Where am I heading with this? Well, to the supply functions, all right? And when these two countries trade with each other, if you have the demand function, which is the same for the two countries, right? And these are the autarky prices, then the world supply function would be somewhere between the two and the world prices would be in the middle of the two autarky prices. Okay. So what can you say about patterns of trade? Well, the relative price of cloth is much lower in the home country. So foreign country would want to buy this good from the home country. So home country will export cloth and the foreign country would export food. Home country would import food. Okay. Since the question does not specify any changes, it is assumed that the relative prices are going to be the same. They haven't changed. Okay. So you're going to be assuming that the price line is parallel even after the shift. Yeah. yeah. And the correct answer is D. Labor is increasing. So given the that the prices have not changed, <clears throat> this would imply that. <clears throat> the good that uses labor intensively is going to increase capital or land intensive good. The production of that good is going to decrease. Yeah. All right. All right. So, uh, second question. There is increase in land. Yeah. So the production possibility frontier is going moving outwards. Yeah. Increase in land. Sugar is land intensive. And cigars are whatever the other factor of production is intensive. Yeah. So in this case, the answer is B. 